Hello, and welcome to Trade Talks, our regular discussion series surrounding all things international trade and transportation. I'm Tom O'Brien with the Center for International Trade and Transportation at Long Beach State University, and I'm pleased to have as my guest today Mario Cordero, the Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach. Mario, welcome to Trade Talks. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's a pleasure being here. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about uh, global trade, which is an exciting industry, um, and a little bit about the Port of Long Beach in particular. And I want to get your, your thoughts about the future of, of how, we move, uh, how we move goods. Um, I want to start, however, with a bit of your background to let our, our audience know how you get to be an executive director. You've taken somewhat of a circuitous path, uh, but a really interesting one. Right, as you indicated, it has been a unique path for me, and uh, in this is industry, it's a very exciting and continuing evolving industry, but uh, I'm, I'm an attorney uh, by occupation, graduated from the law school of uh, University of Santa Clara Law School, and then practiced law for uh, 35 uh, plus years. Uh, and uh, I was appointed uh, back in 2003 uh, by then Mayor Beverly O'Neill to the uh, Board of Harvard Commissioners here in Long Beach, at the Port of Long Beach. And thus commenced my career, so to speak, in this industry. I spent eight years on that commission. Uh, and uh, in 2011, I got this unexpected phone call from the White House inquiring whether I would be interested in being appointed to the Federal Maritime Commission. So making the long story short, uh, I went through that process and eventually became the person they, they wanted to appoint. And so I moved to Washington in the year 2011 and then proceeded to be chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. And I was there for six years. So it was a wonderful experience. And uh, in that six year, again, I got a call from the Port of Long Beach. Uh, they were looking for an executive director and wondered, wondered what I had an interest. And of course, being from Long Beach, I said, absolutely. And then here I am as the executive director. So I'm very blessed to have this position. But again, on the other hand, I'm very excited about being part of the, a major port for this country. Yeah, and you, as, as you mentioned, you have a very unique perspective. You're, as a resident of Long Beach, you've seen the port grow. Uh, as a harbor commissioner, you've been engaged in policy and then spending some time in Washington at the Federal Maritime Commission. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the, the, the Federal Maritime Commission does and its relationship to the port? Because I think it would be interesting for the audience. Sure, the Federal Maritime Commission is a regulatory agency. And uh, historically, again, it's evolved to what became to be the Federal Maritime Commission as uh, the final component of what the structure is now under President John F. Kennedy. So essentially, we regulate the, the ports, marine terminal operators, uh, custom brokers, excuse me, brokers and freight forwarders, and, uh, and also our main primary mandate is to be a watchdog with regard to the international carriers uh, that bring containers to the country and, of course, those containers that go outside the country. And, and as you know, in this business, those water transport carriers are, for the most part, all of them foreign flag international carriers. So that's our mandate. And I did that for six years. And it was a, a very great experience for me, getting another perspective on this great industry. And you, you're, you're suggesting how complex the relationship is with all these partners um, along the supply chain. Talk a little bit, if you would, about, about what the role of the port is, what, um, what it does relative to day-to-day -day operations, the responsibility it has with ocean carriers. I think it would be enlightening for, for the audience. Well, sure. Thank you, Tom. And number one, you know, the, the, the whole conversation about international trade, you know, often when I speak on the subject, I always make sure to say trade begins at the port. And by that, at me, by that I mean, you know, when, uh, whether it's in this generation or in past generations, uh, international trade is not a new thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been in existence for a couple of centuries, uh, and it's evolved to where we're at now. But to the question, in 1911, uh, the city of Long Beach decided to move forward with this port of Long Beach. Uh, we hold it in trust under a tidelands transfer from the state of California. And our mandate is to hold this land in trust in the purpose of, for the purpose of uh, 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 moving forward commerce, fisheries, and recreation. So primarily in today's world, the function of the port is a facilitator to move commerce. Uh, we are the economic engine not only for the city, uh, not only for the state of California, but for the region. And you know, this port is part of the largest port complex in the United States. So together, 
with our neighbor, Port of Los Angeles. Uh, this is the center of commerce, particularly with the major trade partners in Asia. And I, you raise an important point about the, the fact that the ports operate really under state law and, and the people of the state of California have a, have a, a stake in what happens here. Um, but what is, the, what is the role of the city and the port relative to day-to-day -day operations? Are, are you out there moving the goods, spending the time on the docks, or whose yes. responsibility is that? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're furthering trade opportunities here. The containers that arrive here on the West Coast uh, move, uh, move through the Port of Long Beach as well as Los Angeles. But our role as a port here is to make sure that we provide the efficiencies and all that the wherewithal with regard to moving commercial cargo, both in terms of container trade and also boat, liquid or dry boat. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the center of, of commercial goods here. And in today's world, uh, as we know it, the globalized world of international trade, uh, for America, you know, again, you know, the good and the bad in terms of where international trade has evolved, uh, the good aspect of that is it is the focal point now of uh, economic growth for not only uh, this region, but for countries overall over the world, and also works as a, um, how should I say, as a bond with countries to depend on each other in terms of our respective economic needs and growth. So you mentioned the type of things that are moving there. Uh, whether it's liquid products, containerized goods, automobiles. Um, so is it fair to say that you're sort of the landlord for all of these different operations that are, that are occurring at the individual terminals? Yes, you know, we, are, uh, we have a landlord-tenant model here in Southern California. So in this case, the Port of Long Beach is a landlord. The marine terminal operators are run by private enterprises. Mm. There are tenants. But nevertheless, uh, as you have seen here in the last decade, uh, in, more specifically in the last decade, uh, ports, particularly Long Beach, and I think we've been leaders that we're not just a landlord here, we're also here to make sure that we create efficiencies and we facilitate commerce. And of course, later on in the picture came the whole aspect of the Port of Long Beach being a leader in environmental sustainable growth, which I know we'll cover here later yeah, in the we'll program. About that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, You've, given the fact that you manage uh, and oversee the operations of others, there are certain things that are under the control of the port and certain things that are, are external, right, that you have to respond to. What are some of the, the biggest challenges that you, you see um, as an executive director of, of uh, North America's largest port complex in combination, as you said, with the Port of LA? Well, number one, uh, the biggest challenge for the port and in the last decade and going forward is the, the involvement of what we call the big ships, the ultra-large container vessels. You know, Tom, when I was appointed in 2003 as a commissioner at the Port of Long Beach, you know, the average vessel at that time was 4,000 TEUs, what we call 20-foot equivalent containers. Uh, in 2008, we saw the 8,000 TEU vessel uh, arriving at the Port of Long Beach. That is a vessel which brings 8,000 containers. Uh, when I left for Washington in 2011, we were looking to 9, 10,000 TEU vessels. And today, 13, 14,000 TEU vessels is commonplace. As a matter of fact, just two years ago, uh, uh, we received a vessel as large as an 18,000 TEU vessel. So we are a deep water port, and uh, because of the, the visionary of our commission, and prior commissions, uh, we then made a decision many years ago to be big ship ready. In other words, today, not only are we a deep water port, but we have the ability to service 16, 18,000 TU vessels that, come, that would come to the port today. But in addition, uh, we do have the ability of even servicing 20, 21,000. And soon after the completion of one of our major projects, the Long Beach Container Terminal, uh, we will be able to host or call or service vessels that call as large as 24,000. So that's one of our major challenges. Uh, and then number two, on a geo geopolitical front, you know, currently there's been a challenge with regard to the conversation that's been had with regard to the United States and the China dynamic. And of course, what we commonly refer to as a trade war or the tariff discussion. And that has been a challenge in that it creates uncertainties. But hopefully, again, I think the latest indicators we have, there's appears to be a meeting of the minds now coming forward between China and the United States, which is good news for both those countries and certainly good news for the international trade community. What does that mean for a port like Long Beach? 
in terms of, of impact? Is it potential, you know, decrease in the amount of goods that are coming through here? What do you, what do you have to, to confront on a daily basis? Well, certainly decrease in the amount of goods is one. Also, the increased cost of those goods that continue to come uh, to the port of Long Beach. Because again, at the end of the day, uh, in the United States, we are a uh, an economy based on consumer demand. You know, the, the great news that we've had here in the last couple of years, and actually going back a number of years as we evolved from the 2008-2009 recession, is we have a great economy. Uh, not only on the domestic front, but it's fair to say that even on the global front, there's been a, a very good economy. So I think this conversation about the trade war and the tariffs, unfortunately, has occurred in a time of economic growth. So as to the impact with the Pearl of Long Beach, you know, for the most part in 2018, we haven't had any significant impacts. Now, of course, as the conversation had continued regarding the application of tariffs to the tune of 10 and now 25% on 200 billion worth of goods, then of course, we would see an impact on that definitively. I can't tell you exactly the percentile, but you know, our staff has done some preliminary uh, indicators of studies that we could be impacted as much as 20 to 25%. But the good news is, again, the, this administration has uh, apparently put a hold on the application of a 25% tariff, which was talked about of uh, applying here in, on January 1st, 2019. So there's a, there's a hold on that for 90 days. So a lot of us are very optimistic that again, uh, we'll, we'll be able to move forward once the two countries come to a meeting of the minds on the pertinent issues that are before them. That's good, and if I've learned anything about the supply chain, it's that it, it doesn't like uncertainty. So even the, the, toss, the talk or the risk of tariffs is, is not healthy for, for global trade. And, and you could see that, Tom, with, with, the, uh, with the stock market. You know, you know every day, mm -hmm. the, for investors, it does create uncertainties. And of course, like any other industry, we depend on the, uh, uh, the optimistic uh, view of, of investors with regard to this particular industry. So it has created uncertainties, but again, uh, it appears that we're making a turn here for the better. That's good. You, you mentioned the, the larger vessels and getting ready for, for those. What's driving those changes in the industry? Is it, is it purely economics or is there something else at play? Well, the major drive is economics. You know, I think for vessel carriers, they've been rather challenged, particularly commencing back in 2008, where uh, the rates that they charge to move this container from Shanghai, let's say to Long Beach, uh, were not sustainable. I mean, it was, bottom line, too much capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the one part, what uh, a concept that came to be here in the last few years was this concept of economies of scale. So if you increase the size of the, of the vessel, put more containers, and it added to that an alliance of carriers, that would cut the costs, the transportation costs, of, in terms of the volume of the cargo. So in large part, economics was a driver mm -hmm. uh, to this. and. Uh, it's continued to be a question in terms of the sustainable rates, but again, you're starting to see now that for the carriers, it looks like there's light at the end of the tunnel for them. And what does it mean for, for the port that has to handle those larger vessels? It's, is it, it's more land, it's more labor, change in operations? What do you, what do you have to do to be ready? Well, uh, at least for the port of Long Beach, the good news is we are ready. You know, what it, what, what it means for us is the decisions that were made years ago to uh, invest in our infrastructure. You know, the Port of Long Beach has invested at the tune of $4 billion in capital improvement projects. Uh, and this decision, again, made by commissions over the years to not only big, be big ship ready, but be able to move this cargo in a way that the expectation of the uh, beneficial cargo owner has. So uh, for us, the involvement of what we have now is, is good news for the Port of Long Beach because uh, we're able to handle those big vessels in a way and meet the expectations of the cargo owners in terms of efficiencies and getting the goods to market. Do you get a sense, having spent some time in Washington, that there's a clear understanding of the importance of trade to the nation or a clear policy direction that's, I guess to, to, to use a turn of phrase, who's, who's driving the boat? Well, there's certainly a clear understanding as to whether there's a clear policy, I think we're going through that discussion right now. And we have been in that discussion for several years in this country. And I'm referring to, you know, a, a, a national freight policy, so to speak, that uh, we've been, it's been a continued challenge, so to speak, in this country to 
uh, come together with, with a substantive policy. But I think, uh, uh, you know, if anything, the trade war that, or the tariff discussions that have evolved in the past years has really highlighted the, the impacts of impeding trade, you know, at every level, whether it's at the level of the American farmer, the American shipper, the American manufacturer, the exporter, the importer, and the average consumer, at every level they would be impacted by disruptions in the supply chain, disruptions in international trade. And, we're start, and we've seen that now in the last year. So I think we're all cognizant that uh, what we need to do is not only continue with a recognition of the importance of trade, but move forward to maximize investment in trade and have substantive policies that create for this country a clear roadmap in terms of the important uh, uh, aspects of the supply chain, whether it's East Coast, South Coast, Gulf, and the Great Lakes. So I think uh, we are having that conversation today. And that, that's, a, that's an interesting point in that you, you almost have to sell or at least let the people in the, the heartland know that the ability to buy affordable goods, electronics made in China, depends in part upon the, uh, the free-flowing goods through the, uh, the port of Long Beach, for example. Absolutely, and I think, Tom, I think it's fair to say that any time there's been a bottleneck in that flow of goods, then of course it hits the front page and, and people see those impacts. So fortunately for Long Beach, uh, we're doing very well in terms of our efficiencies. Uh, there's no congestion here at this port. As a matter of fact, uh, for calendar year 2017, we moved 7.5 million containers, the most in our 107 year history, going back to 1911. And for fiscal year that we just completed, fiscal year 2018, we moved the tune of 8 million containers, again a historical mark. So um, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful and, and blessed to be part of the Port of Long Beach in terms of particularly what we're doing again to think ahead in terms of what the future brings. And you mentioned efficiencies, and so I'm guessing that the, the answer to staying ahead of the curve is not just the infrastructure development, it's looking, about, looking at ways to do the job better. Right? Exactly, it's not just a matter of brick and mortar in terms of infrastructure as we know it, but it's also what we call a, a technological infrastructure, the age of technology. And I think that's where we're at today in terms of looking ahead and how we implement technology in this industry, and particularly for us at the Port of Long Beach, how we become a leader or continue our leadership in various fronts, including how we have more transparency, more visibility on cargo, and that's in fact the conversation we're having now. In terms of, of deploying technology at the port and how you, how you work with your partners at it's either a, end of the supply chain. More specifically, Tom, what we're talking about is today is an information portal, a single window platform where we have as much maritime data put into this platform so that all the stakeholders, whether you're a trucker, uh, whether you're a cargo owner, uh, 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 railroads, and all the stakeholders have visibility in terms of their cargo, have all this information in one portal window. So that's the next step. And you, it's, a, it's a good bridge to the discussion we want to have uh, after our break, uh, which is about the leadership role that the port is taking, not only in technology, but something you referred to earlier, which is, is the, the environmental innovations that have been required to make sure that the port operates in a way that respects the, the community in which it operates. So um, we will be back after the short break to, to continue our discussion with Mario Cordero, the executive director of the Port of Long Beach. Should your company buy or sell? Expand or not? Relocate? Or simply stay the same? If you'd like to examine past and present predictions, integrating finances and people, and make future predictions based on all that information, a career in economics is for you. You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Trade Talks. I'm Tom O'Brien, and our guest today is Mario Cordero, the Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach. Um, Mario, before the break, we were talking about sort of generally some of the global trends that are impacting trade. Um, I want to turn our attention now to some of the things that the Port of Long Beach has done really as a leader to drive 
the trends uh, that are shaping at least port operations. Um, let's talk first about environmental programs. Um, I think the port, rightly so, is, is viewed as being a leader um, in environmental uh, mitigation, uh, but beyond that, in, in being creative about the ways to um, address the potential impacts of trade while also accommodating growth. Can you talk a little bit about why that is so important uh, to the Port of Long Beach? Well, thank you for your question, Tom. And I think uh, when we talk about the environmental initiatives that have uh, been born here at the Port of Long Beach, that's, that's probably our greatest story mm -hmm. that clearly separates us from any other port uh, in, in the nation, uh, as a matter of fact, on the international front. Now, uh, and so uh, the benefit to all this has been, you know, when I joined the commission in 2003, there were certainly challenges that were occurring here at the Port of Long Beach. And the then mayor who appointed me, uh, Beverly O'Neill, um, was concerned about, you know, what we needed to do to grow our business. And the first question is what we needed to do is as a port be more conscious of some of the community concerns and thus came the environmental question in the agenda, which led ultimately to a policy in 2005 uh, that we termed the Green Port Policy. Now, there were a lot of naysayers back then in terms of what that really meant, but the great news for the Port of Long Beach was the fact that we believed that the commission at that time, that if we move forward with what we call sustainable growth, grow green, that we were gonna be able to succeed and continue our, our economic growth, continue our investment in infrastructure, and have a buy-in uh, from the city of Long Beach. And that's exactly what happened. So with that, uh, we became uh, internationally known uh, for the Port of Long Beach here in terms of what we did at the Green Port, uh, as a Green Port. Uh, now, I also want to give kudos to the Port of Los Angeles mm -hmm. because we also came together with the Cleaner Action Plan and together we revolutionized what many people thought we couldn't do about reducing harmful emissions from port operations. And the last I'll say on this is, for me, it, it ultimately what came to be a, I became a very direct beneficiary from this because when I indicated to you in 2011, all of a sudden out of clear blue, I get this call from the White House. And after I went through the process and, and I moved to DC, I, I of course asked this question, you know, how, did, how did I, how did I get that call? Because I certainly didn't lobby for this position with the Obama administration. And the question came, or the answer to that question was, I was advised that the president was looking to fill a position on the Federal Maritime Commission, but he was looking for someone from, the, from a poor authority who had uh, environmental conscious in terms of making sure that mm -hmm. we would further the president's agenda regarding issues like climate change and environmental initiatives in the maritime industry. So, of course, the poor Long Beach was highlighted here, mm -hmm. and, and again, I, I became a beneficiary of that. So I think uh, it's a great story for this city, it's a great story for this port, and we continue now because the latest evolvement that, of this commission that I serve for, uh, we're moving towards zero emission, Tom. Uh, that's that's, that's, a, that's a, a remarkable statement today that by 2030, we will have zero emission equipment at the terminals, and by 2035, we will have zero emission truck transportation, that is either hydrogen fuel tr uh, cell trucks, electric trucks, and no more uh, particular matter in terms of uh, coming from whether by way of transportation mode, trucks, and or the equipment on the terminal. So we continue with that mindset. And how does that happen? I mean, what, who needs to be at the table? What decisions need to be made? Because those, those are ambitious goals. Mm. Well, I think how that's happened is, um, Again, the, the political will that, uh, at least going back to the Greenport policy and the 2006 Cleaner Action Plan, it took the political will of a commission working with our stakeholders and of course our elected officials. We're going through that now. You know, how is it gonna happen and we're gonna move towards zero emission? Well, we're not gonna be able to do that unless we have a buy-in from the state of California. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, the state of California had something to say about what their vision of the state is in terms of transportation and emissions. But it also comes again, uh, the commission that I serve, I think is a very visionary commission in which they now wanna take it to the next level, you know, the green port of the future. So it takes collaboration, working with stakeholders and getting buy-in and I think it's, we did it before and we're doing it again. And you're talking about broad-based impact, right? You mentioned trucks and 
the ocean going vessels, but it also impacts yard equipment mm -hmm. as well. So it's, it's across the board, right? It, it covers railroads, it covers trucks, it covers uh, the vessels. Uh, but when I focused on the trucks, that was the one that we had a more uh, indirect control, so to speak, because with international vessels, it gets a little bit uh, uh, a gray area there in terms of what can we do to really control that. We have to defer to the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, in terms of an international standard. But the good news is what this commission has done and this port has done is we've created uh, uh, subsidies, so to speak, or discounts for international vessels who will cooperate, as an example, our green flag program, you know, that, that program basically, uh, we will reduce dockage for these international carriers if they reduce their speed. Uh, reduction of speed in vessels as they come into the Santa Barbara Channel means uh, translates into reduction of emissions. So uh, that has been a great success for us. And of course, implementing uh, uh, cold ironing or short power mm -hmm. is another way that we assist the international carriers so when they come at birth, they no longer have to have those engines turned based on bunker fuel, but based on shore power electrical. They actually plug into the plug in, plug which into means the shore side. Yeah. no emissions. So these are the ways that we have kind of uh, continued to push the envelope to work with uh, our stakeholders. And you you mentioned earlier that that some of this has been done in conjunction with the, your neighbor at the Port of Los Angeles, and I think it's worth underscoring because that in itself is a fairly revolutionary approach mm -hmm. to take the leap of faith to work with what is essentially your your biggest competitor right. next door. What, why and how did that come about? Well, I think number one, when we talk about the the, the environmental concerns related to port operations. You know, uh, it wasn't just Long Beach, it was Los Angeles. I mean, like I said, it's all one port complex. Mm -hmm. So whether you have emissions, harmful emissions from this side of the bridge or the other side of the bridge for the port complex that evolves to a significant impact on the local communities. So for us to be successful, it, it took the political will for, of both cities and both commissions to come together and work together to accomplish an objective. And on that, when you talk about the 2006 Cleaner Action Plan, Think about this, Tom. Within 10 years, or even less, these two ports were able to implement initiatives that translated to reduction of 88% in particular matter, 49% in NOx, and today in the 97th, 96, 97 percentile reduction in SOx, mm -hmm. uh, sulfur oxide. So it, it's a great story, and I think despite our friendly competition, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, examples how we work together for the benefit of, of, of the complex. It, is there something unique about Southern California that made it possible to do that here first? Yeah, I think what's unique about Southern California is that we're in the state of California. You know, the state of Fair California enough. has been seen as a leader in, in, in the environment, whether it's uh, reducing uh, pollution with, uh, uh, with vehicles, cars, or, or, or increasing uh, uh, in terms of the gas mileage that uh, cars uh, uh, over the years uh, uh, in terms of the usage of fuel. So we've been blessed in my mind to be in the state of California because they've, they've raised the bar and I think the people of the state of California have seen the remarkable progress in various uh, initiatives that at the end of the day leads to um, growing business and healthy communities. So last I'll say on this, you know, there are, there has been criticism of the state of California in terms of how uh, we go about things, so to speak, but despite uh, those constructive criticisms, uh, if I may use that term, here's the fact. The fact is we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, and, and there's no other state in this nation that can make that claim, uh, whether we're the fifth or the sixth. So I, I, I think we're doing things right here in this state and more particular as it relates to ports, I think we're doing things, uh, remarkable things at the Southern California ports. Are there any risks though to sort of Taking the lead on this, do you have any fears that competitors in other parts of the country will use the, the programs and the perceived cost of those programs against you to try to attract business away? Well, number one, anytime you take leadership in any area, uh, you, you shouldn't have a fear and you know you're going to create a risk. So we knew that from the get-go. And the risk back then was, are we going to lose business because of that, because our competitors in the Gulf and in the East Coast you know, perhaps could attract this cargo at a lower cost. The irony of where this 
um, discussion evolved, I'm talking about the Greenport policy and the environmental initiatives, is that uh, our leadership created environmental initiatives in every major port in this country. So there's, every major port has some form of a clean truck plan, mm -hmm. uh, some form of environmental initiatives, whether related to air and water. So I think uh, for us, you know, we remain to be the port of choice here in Southern California. Now admittedly, you know, the competition is fierce in terms of, and here's where my knowledge of being in DC for six years, because when I was there for six years, I was port neutral, you know, of course, as a regulatory agency. Sure. So I had the occasion uh, to visit every major container port in the nation. And, you know, to my friends in the East Coast and the Gulf, they're doing great things to elevate their infrastructure. So at the end of the day, there's plenty of business for everybody. And if we come together as a country and recognize that as a country, we want to make sure that the various entries of port are efficient and, and are uh, environmentally friendly, then it's a win for everybody. So on that, I, I don't mind deferring to what other ports may be doing, but yeah. keeping our eye on the ball here, I just gave you our numbers in terms of calendar sure. year 2017 and fiscal year 2018. No one could argue that we continue to be a leader, not only in terms of our environmental quest, but also the, type of, the, the amount of volume that we're moving here. So for the naysayers in 2006 who thought we were gonna lose business, right. that has not happened. What are you hearing when you travel around the world to other ports? What's the, what's the perception, what's the image of, of Long Beach? Long Beach has a great image. I mean, you know, just this year, we were recognized by a, Asia Cargo News as the, the best green port uh, uh, policy uh, port entryway in the world, uh, the green port of the year or something. So I think the recognition in the international front, first and foremost, uh, on the environmental front, we're second to no one. Mm -hmm. uh, as to the business aspect of it, I think the poor Long Beach is on the map, whether you're talking about Europe or Asia or any part in the world, because again, at the end of the day, uh, I just mentioned California is the fifth largest economy it varies, fifth, sixth, but in that regard, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are imported into the state and in fact exported. And by the way, it's not just for the state, but for the United States overall. So okay. re in relation to China, you know, 69% of our imported goods come to the Port of Long Beach uh, that, that we receive from China is about 69%. And there's a good percentile that continues to move to the East Coast. So that container that leaves Shanghai, we could get it to Chicago 11 days earlier then that container goes to the Panama Canal and up to the East Coast. So, uh, you know, we will continue to have no fear and we will continue to take risks. And, you, and proven you can have both, right? You exactly. can have, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier the fact that one of the things you're working on is sort of the technology mm -hmm. component of, of addressing the challenges, preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about that. The, the port's role in the, in the broader supply chain and, and your efforts um, uh, to bring better visibility mm -hmm. to how we move good. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the information portal you referenced earlier? I think the next horizon for this port, and for that matter the industry, is the, the extent of how you apply technology. And I think we're, 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 we're taking risk here. And by that I mean it's going to require a lot of investment, financial investment. We're in the age of cybersecurity, which, you know, uh, that has been problematic for many industries in terms of when you depend on technology and you know uh, you expose yourself so to speak in terms of uh, what could happen but nevertheless I think we're also investing on our information management uh, to create the state-of-the-art firewalls so but going back to the application of technology I think you know we're in the age of, of, of making sure that we have as much visibility and as much transparency in moving your cargo. So let me give you an example. Whether it's the Port of Long Beach or any other major container port, you know, if you're a beneficial cargo owner, a shipper moving your cargo, you know, you have your cargo coming from Shanghai or other parts of the world, you want to know where that container is at a certain point in time. Sure. You want to know when that container arrives. But you don't want to know on the day of. You would like to have at least two week anticipation and that's when we get into visibility. If we create and implement technology by way of a portal in which the shipper could know exactly that two weeks before you know your container is going to arrive at the Port of Long Beach, the efficiencies that creates is huge. And I think once this container arrives, 
you know that when it's shipped to shore, that is when the container is unloaded from the carrier to the terminal, you know exactly when that is, you know exactly when you could pick up your container, when you could uh, obtain your chassis, so that the continue, particularly with intermodal movement of, of cargo, you know exactly how this goes to the supply chain all the way to Chicago. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's something that we've come to expect as consumers when we place an order that we know where it is at any given moment and we can track it to our door. I'm curious then, why hasn't it happened up till now along the supply chain? What's, what's so difficult about those partners working together to share that information? Well, that's a very good question and that's what we're attempting to do. I think there's an aspect here that uh, of any time you, you deviate from the status quo, and you're trying to bring people on board for the next new vision or application. At the end of the day, the first thing stakeholders would think, a you know, uh, little bit facetious, the first reaction by a stakeholder is, what is it, what, what is it for me? Uh, what is it for me? Sure. What's my cost? And what do I have to give you? And the give you is maritime data. Mm -hmm. So we're going through a period right now that this concept of a portal about putting as much maritime data on a portal we want to make clear it has nothing about revealing your proprietary interests. As a matter of fact, quite to the contrary, we want to respect that. So I think it's going to take some time for people to be comfortable to give their data to this information portal. And when I say people, I'm talking about across the board in the supply chain because that's the goal and the objective. So the hesitancy has been what is it going to cost and, and two, what's, what's my role in terms of the kind of information I reveal? But if we all come down to the, come to the table with the common ground is, what's, what's in it for all of us? What's in it for all of us is that that beneficial cargo owner, that shipper who brings their goods to Southern California, will bring their goods because you are the state-of-the-art leader in technology and they feel secure about moving their cargo. And what we're actually talking about here is real time. You know, at the end of the day, a shipper will, will pay if you guarantee them they're gonna, you're going to get their goods to market within a certain time period in the most efficient, transparent, reliable, and, vision, and, and visionary fashion. They'll pay that reasonable cost, whatever that ultimately is. So I think, back to your question, it's like any other thing, going back to my experience with the Greenport policy. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were able, Tom, to bring everybody together to accomplish the result of reducing particulate matter by 88%. If we believe we could bring everybody together to bring zero emission to Long Beach in 2030, then why cannot we believe we could bring everybody together to bring the state-of-the-art efficient movement in the supply chain? This could be done. We just have to have people kind of contemplate this question and look for the better good as opposed to maybe a particular self-interest issue that may create an issue for you. Well, so what you're talking about is, is an exciting future where people are cooperating to the benefit of all of the parties, including the consumer. Um, when we come back after a short break, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, and ask you to look into your crystal ball and, sure. and think about how, we, how we're going to move goods in the future. And sure. We'll be right back. International business, huh? Number one, know the culture of that country. Come alive with Pepsi. Translated into Chinese is, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. PepsiCo made that mistake in Taiwan. Learn about strategic planning, government policy, and policy analysis, and so much more. You can become a part of this exciting career field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Trade Talks. I'm Tom O'Brien, and I'm joined again by my guest, uh, Mario Cordero, the Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach. Um, Mario, before the break, we, we had an opportunity to talk about um, sort of port operations in general and the unique role that's being played by the Port of Long Beach. Um, and you've given us a good overview of the current state of operations. I'm curious, in, in all of your, your years in this industry here and in Washington, what's been the most significant change you've observed? Um, is, it, is it the technology? Is it e-commerce? Is it the rise of Asia's trading center? What, what strikes you the most when you think back? 
Well, first of all, today it's e-commerce. But if, if I go back a few years, I think what has been striking over the last few years is the size of these vessels. They're huge. And, and the last, as it relates to ports, is the, the, the demand, uh, the movement of this cargo. Because, you know, we are at the cusp of what people envision globalization to be. Now, you know, there's pros and cons about this, but the fact is there's no stepping back from that. So I think where we evolved now in terms of that conversation has been very interesting that, as a matter of fact, that's why we have bigger vessels. I talked about this concept of economies of scale. But today, Tom, I think what's striking to me is we're talking about speed. And thus comes the question of e-commerce and what I referenced earlier this year in my state of port speech as the Amazon state of mind. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that. What does that mean for, for, for the port? Right, in terms of adjusting to, to a new way of, of living. Well, what that means to the port is it's about speed. You know, the customer wants their goods now. You know, uh, and so for me, I think to manage a port and what we, our objectives are as a port is how do we expedite the movement of cargo so that, uh, you know, I said earlier, you know, we have a, uh, a mark that we say that we could move that container from Shanghai to Chicago 11 days earlier uh, from the West Coast. Well, what if we move that nine days earlier or seven days earlier within a week? You know, if we did that, Tom, we don't have to worry about our competition because one of the things that uh, I like to say about the West Coast, we have the most advanced and the best railroad infrastructure than anywhere in the nation. Mm -hmm. Thanks to our uh, maybe in the world, yeah. right? Yeah. Thanks to our partnership yeah. with the Class One railroads. In this case, BNSF and Union Pacific. So, I think it's all about speed, you know. And and how do we unload that container faster? How do we get that container out of the terminal faster and out the gate? Uh, and how do we put it through the supply chain? And I think this is what we're working on. And uh, it's easier said than done. Yeah, it's interesting even to, to think that this, this whole question of containerization is relatively recent mm -hmm. as a phenomenon. We weren't, we weren't moving goods in containers before the mid-1950s, right. um, and it hadn't changed for years. So the, the, the change between then and now has been, has been astronomical and exponential. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with that. So let's move from the past, though, to the future. And I, I mentioned that crystal ball. Um, what do you see as the next big thing on the horizon that's going to impact the way you operate at the Port of Long Beach? What I see is because of our reference to e-commerce and this Amazon state of mind, uh, you know, we're approaching the holiday season or we're already in the holiday season. Mm -hmm. Think about this, Tom. A consumer right now could get on the computer, press a button, and they could have their goods tomorrow. You know, that's the concept that growing up, I was not even introduced to that. You know, but the new generation coming up, expects it. that's what they expect. So how does that change the mindset of a port or should change the mindset of a port? In answer to your question, Tom, what I see the future at some point, admittedly, not a near temp term, uh, initiative, but a long term, that at some point we are going to be a 24 7 operation. In other words, this container is going to move through the terminal day and night, much, li much like the container is unloaded from the vessel today. The 24 concept is not, 7 concept is not new. When an international carrier arrives at a port at birth, it's expected that that vessel will be loaded, unloaded day and night, then the vessel goes to the next port. If you don't do that, that vessel doesn't come to your port. So it's not a novel concept. What is novel is to continue that mindset as that container is placed on the terminal. One of the problems that we've had, and it's not just a port lobby, it's just, you know, major ports, is you know, we gotta get away from like, this is just a day operation. That the gates are only open from eight to five. Now, in fairness, for Southern California, we've had the peer pass program here for several years, 
it kind of introduced the day-night gates. But mm -hmm. we're not there in my mind in terms of what I talk about a 24-7 mindset. So what I see in the future that ultimately, I just mentioned to you, we moved 8 million containers in this fiscal year. Now, last year, calendar year 2017, the two ports moved a total almost 16 plus million containers. The forecast that by 2030, these two ports will be moving upwards of 27 million containers. Now, I think if you do the math, there's no way you're gonna move that amount of containers by limited gate hours. Sure. So ultimately, we are going to move to a 24-7 operation. That, from, in my mind, is the next big step for this industry here in Southern California to put that in place. And w why hasn't it happened yet? Well, like I said, it, it's happened in two areas. It's happened when it comes to when the vessel arrives, like right. I mentioned to you. You could, you could drive by the port at 3 in the morning, and the IOWU dock workers are working at 3 in the morning unloading these containers. You could put that container on rail through the Alameda corridor, and the Alameda corridor is 24-7. And that's the rail? That's the rail to, to uh, uh, downtown or the Hubbard uh, going out to the inland uh, 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 connectivity, the intermodal connectivity, and on to Chicago, you know. So that's 24-7 already. But why it hasn't happened in the middle of this supply chain? I think, again, it goes to the fact that uh, it is a cost issue. Mm -hmm. You know, do you hire labor? around the clock, uh, and at some point, we need to have a, a very, uh, roll up our sleeves and have a conversation that, okay, you know, if we do that, and we signal to the shipping industry, the shipper, that if you come to the port of Long Beach, you, we can guarantee you your container's gonna be moving day and night. Now, I'm being a little bit, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but if we could get to moving containers for 16 consistent hours, on certain nights of the week, uh, I think that's a big step. But again, that's what we need to do here. And why it has not happened is because again, keep in mind that the marine terminal operators where these containers land are private enterprises. Mm -hmm. So they have their business interests to, to, to address and, uh, and you know, it's like any other business. You know, uh, they need to be cost effective. So I think the trick here is how do we work with them for ultimately this being cost effective. But all I know, and the last thing I'll share on this, I know one thing. If you do that, it's sort of like the field of dreams cliche, built it and they will come. I'm absolutely confident that if we do that, the shipper who comes to this port is gonna continue to see Long Beach not only as a port of choice, but the port where they're gonna be confident that their cargo removes in an efficient, reliable, and expedited, consistent fashion. I'm curious with, when you talk about sort of the, the come and, and how much depends upon the, the infrastructure growth and the, the economies of scale. Is there an upper limit to all of this? Is there a ship that becomes too big to, to actually to be workable or serviceable or where you? Well, I don't think there is. And let me explain that answer. When I was a commissioner years ago, when I saw that 8,000 TEU vessel come to the Port of Lawis, I thought, man, this, this vessel is huge. We could not build any bigger vessels. I'm back now as executive director, and we're receiving 13, 14,000 TU vessels, and soon, larger vessels. Mm -hmm. Twice as big as that 8,000 TU vessel that I witnessed in 2008. If you read reports like the McKinsey Report, who's forecasting what does this industry look like in 50 years, they're actually saying that we're gonna have a 50,000 TEU vessel. Yeah. I can't imagine that, but then again, I could never imagine 18, 20,000 TEU vessel back in 2008. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll see where this goes, but uh, uh, needless to say that I think uh, when you talk about the future, for us as a port, uh, we can't just think about the future, we gotta be ready for the future, and I think that's the great story of the Port of Long Beach that I've been a very, very beneficiary to come here and, and lead a port that's already been a leader in many areas. So you're working on that prep preparations for that 50,000 TEU vessel? Well, you know, I'm certainly having that <laughs> conversation about not only are we big ship ready, but we have to look into the future in terms of uh, being ready in all aspects. And, and again, I, I'm not worried about the competition. I, I, you know, I'm a big, as you know, sports fan, I'm a big baseball fan. Yes, go Dodgers. 
And just imagine, you know, a baseball player. I'm not playing the game in the outfield looking at the scoreboard. And I, I, I'm here to win. I'm just focusing on this game and, you know, the best to my competition. But I think Long Beach has proven, if anything, that our leadership continues to uh, mark us as a port of choice. And when you look again, the great leadership we've had on the environmental front, naysayers back in 2006 thought, thought we were going to lose a large market share and that we're really going to damage our footprint mm -hmm. in the business community. None of that came about. There's others who, who sort of envision a world of local production, 3D printing, making the ports um, obsolescent, essentially. Is that, is that anything that concerns you? Well, you know, we talked about e-commerce. 3D, 3D printing is another technology that, again, is much discussed, you know, and, and how, how we're going to move items or not move items. I think that at the end of the day, uh, for the movement of commercial goods, whether bulk, dry bulk, liquid bulk, containers, uh, ports have been a, a, a very big part of our historical market and trade mm -hmm. and will continue to be no matter what changes we have. And I think, uh, uh, again, the trick is to make sure that uh, you have the discussions that, you know, not just talk about it, but, you know, you can't beat them, join them. So that's, that's the fabulous discussion in terms that we're having today in terms of what's the next step for us. On a more serious note, there, there are concerns about the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and while the, the Port of Long Beach has taken a leadership role in, in controlling the impacts of port operations and the coal green port policy, um, how is the port preparing for a future where, you know, where tides and, and rising waters may be, may be part of the equation? Good question. I think, number one, just a few years ago, we uh, promulgated a study to address this whole question of climate change, more specific to sea level. You know, how much of this sea level is going to be reduced here at this port complex? Now, the good news is that over the many years, the projects that we have put into place uh, have raised the level uh, of our port operations in terms of its physical infrastructure. Uh, so. If by 2050 the sea level is impacted, let's say by two feet, as, someone, as some people believe that may be, <laughs> it's not going to be a serious impact to us. Uh, but again, we're hoping that at least in the next 50 years, as a country, we come together to recognize what is important about this climate change conversation that needs to be done. And I think more and more people are recognizing. I mean, certainly, if you ask anybody in the scientific community, it's like unanimity here on the issue of climate change. I think there's still, at the political level, uh, some debate on this, but I, 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 no matter what we have today, if you go back just 10 years, there's been a lot of progress that we've made as a country and as a world, uh, as a world community to address climate change issues and, and whether it's environmental quality or water quality. So I'm, I'm very optimistic we're gonna continue with that conversation. You, you use the term community, and one of the things we haven't even really talked about is the, the beneficial impact that port operations have on local employment and, and the local workforce. Talk for a minute, if you would, about um, the, the, the types of, of employment opportunities that exist in a port and, and the wide range of, of ways to connect to global trade. Well. Yes, I'll answer that question and, in addition, add to the question in terms of what we're doing for the future workforce. Yeah. So, number one, you know, direct jobs from the Port of Long Beach for the city is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 jobs. Uh, as far as a region, that number increases to the tune of uh, 150,000, 300,000 jobs. And I'm talking about the southwest region, particularly California mm -hmm. as a state. In terms of direct, indirect jobs in the supply chain for the nation, you're talking about 1.5 million jobs that come from this port. So obviously it's a job creator. And uh, so I think for international trade, uh, certainly part of the conversation in terms of the benefits of international trade, uh, when you look at the supply chain, it does create jobs. It is an economic engine. It is a job producer. Now, as to what we're doing in the future, the Port of Long Beach, through the leadership of our present commission, has now kind of wrapped their arms around workforce development. Mm -hmm. What does this job market look, in, look like in the future? 
the reality is there's a lot of conversation about robotics, you know, a lot of conversation that technology may eliminate jobs. So however one stands on that issue, I think as a Port of Long Beach, our commission has taken the leadership that we need to prepare the next generation for the skill set that's going to be required in this industry. And here's where we talk about our relationship with whether it's Long Beach Unified School District and the uh, Cabrillo High School Global Academy. And now moving forward to a STEMS-like uh, uh, program that we're trying to envision with Long Beach Unified School District because of the importance of those jobs in the future. Uh, to at least introduce to this generation what's going to be required in the future. So, and to the level of working with Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach, or Long Beach State University, my alumni here, well, an alumni of Cal State, uh, or Long Beach State as I'd like to say back then. Uh, but we're, we're creating opportunities here in partnerships, and the most latest one, motivated or, or mobilized by our commission is, you know, joining the College Promise, which the port now is going to be at the table in terms of assisting by way of the advisory council on the curriculum and identifying jobs of the future that we need to kind of prepare the next generation. So, And, and by College Promise, you're talking about that partnership between the Long Beach School District, the Community College District, and Long Beach State to help create pathways to the university and to actually guarantee spots in some cases for students coming out of those programs. Correct. So our role as a part, when, uh, you know, we're the first industry component to be part of the car, uh, 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 College Promise. So our role at the port is to make sure that we assist and advise in terms of the maritime related opportunities, which, which are huge. It, it's, it's, um, I think it's worth mentioning because I think people think about the work on the docks as being the dock workers who have a critical role to play. But there are so many other pieces and, and, and career pathways and um, futures that are exciting that are some, in some cases technology driven. Exactly. Like I said, it, you know, our success, uh, I have to give a, a thank you to the dock workers and the men and women who are out there in terms of making sure we uh, stay competitive. But also, it's more than just the dock workers uh, for us at the port. And I'm talking about the supply chain, you know, whether it's dock workers, truck drivers, freight forwarders, warehouse, and, you know, on and on with the supply chain. So again, what we're looking to in the future is uh, these concepts of making sure that our discussion today also includes workforce development. And I assume that's why you're, you're starting with the, the K through 12 piece to make sure that that message gets out there early and often. Absolutely. Well, Mario, I want to thank you for, for taking part in this discussion today. It's been, um, it's been interesting and, and enlightening, I think, for our audience. So, so thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And thank you for joining us and being part of this discussion. And I hope you'll consider joining us the next time we gather around the negotiating table for Trade Talks. I'm Tom O'Brien. Thank you and goodbye.